Ms. Jarita Waters. She's the band director at Lieutenant Jails Middle School. She's a native of Comfort, North Carolina. She attended Joan County Public Schools and graduated from Jones Senior High School in Trenton, North Carolina. She received her bachelor's degree in music education with instrumental emphasis on trumpets at the Federal State University and received her master's degree at Anderson University. While an undergraduate at Federal State University, she was involved in every performing ensemble available for trumpet and voice. She participated in the Marching Bronco Express, the FSU Jazz Express, the Brass Ensemble, Trumpet Choir, University Concert Choir, Main Attraction, and Opera Workshop. As a freshman trumpet player, she was seated as the principal chair, where she remained until she graduated. At FSU, she served several leadership roles as section leader, dance committee president, and taught various brass and trumpet camps for youth held at the university. 
She also had the opportunity to play in the orchestra's pit and the following operas, The Magic Flute, HMS Pinafore, The Marriage of Figaro, and The All Night Strut. After receiving compensation from performing with other professional musicians, it opened her eyes to brand new possibilities of playing. Even being involved in several other activities, she maintained honors through her undergraduate career. After graduating, Miss Waters was unable to obtain a band position in the county. She was presented the opportunity to teach choir at Luther Nix Gerald's Middle School and she accepted the offer. There, she was able to increase the choral enrollment and recruit amazing talent. During this time, the choir was awarded excellent superior ratings at various adjudications. She was voted Teacher of the Year in the year 2015. After five years of teaching choir, the band position became available. And without hesitation, she decided to become the band director. Through recruitment and after school tutoring, she was able to double the band enrollment and became a stronger feeder program for E.E. E. Smith High School. She is thankful for all her musical experiences because it prepared her for her career. She recently founded the Clarion Brass ensemble which four current members are band directors and FSU alumni. She is currently the music director and musician at the historic Evans Metropolitan AME Zion Church where our founders at FSU first met for the prestigious Federal State University as we know it. When she's not teaching in the classroom she, she enjoys performing on her instrument as well as teaching private lessons and seeing the personal growth and development in her students. Miss Jarita Water, quote, that she stands by. Music heals and speaks to the innermost part of a human being where hands cannot touch and words can never reach. All right, everyone, just take your uh, phones off of mute and let's give our own, our very own MBX, our very own Fayetteville State alumni, the best welcome, the loudest welcome that we can. You know, let's get an attitude check and all of that. So just take it off mute and let's go ahead and give a hand. Woo! Yes. Right. All right. Well, we're excited, and um, we're going to go ahead and uh, go on mute and um, and turn it over to you. I, I think I have you as a co-host, so you can do whatever you need to do on the screen or whatever you need, you know, and then, um, you know, just let us know. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. It seemed like this has been the longest week or few weeks before this day has came, but I'm so happy that it finally has arrived. And thank you so much, Dr. Reed and Professor Chalmers and the FSU MBX family. I have to say it again, attitude check, Bronco pride to the day I die. I love you all so much and I'm excited about all the wonderful things that you have um, done so far, even during this pandemic. Um, I know it's rough, but I just wanna say thank you so much for for having these Thursdays. I have enjoyed it thoroughly um, and been looking forward to every single one at 4 p.m. And I try to always log in to get an early seat, even though it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter. But as if I was going to walk into the Rosenthal building and to the choir room and sit in the front and pick my seat, I, I just have been so excited. Um, before I begin, I just want to say and give some shout outs to um, all the presenters that have been presenting over the weeks, um, giving us great knowledge um, about their programs and the things that they have done throughout the years that has been successful. Um, shout out to um, one of the programs I feed, Mr. Roosevelt Pratt from E. Smith High School, uh, Mr. Divine Pickett, Hill County High, and also March with Divine at Fayetteville State, Bronco Pride. 
um, Dr. Tamisha Brock, Ms. Sybil Haskins, and Ms. Nicole Collins at 71st High School, who is also was also my drum major while I was at Federal State. Um, and trombonist, yes, trombonist and low brass instructor, Mr. Dandrick Glenn, a phenomenal, wonderful recital that you did on last week. We, we I definitely enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to hearing more exciting things. Everything was a breath of fresh air during this pandemic. It has truly been. And last but not least, I would like to give a shout out to my parents, especially my mom, um, because if it wasn't for her promise that she made to God, if she didn't, if she had children, she was going to expose them to music, and she has kept her promise. Um, here I am today. Um, I cannot say that I wanted to do everything, but I understood why she pushed me and encouraged me throughout. Um, my childhood up until this point um, with music and music is so important. Um, and I would like to also say, um, have a big shout out to all my friends and family and supporters and viewers that are watching near and far, my current and former students that are on. Hello, it's good to see you. I probably wouldn't recognize you because you're probably much taller now. <laughs> and also last but not least, my Lieutenant Gerald's family Thank you so much for coming on and supporting me in every performance and everything I've done. I can count on my Lieutenant Gerald's family to, to be there. And I thank you and love you all so much. So I'm going to get started. So <laughs> after a um, experience of all the speakers that have come the past few weeks and the amazing topics, it made it very tough for me. <laughs> I won't lie to you. It made it tough for me. So I had to get in my quiet place and sit in my thinking chair and think, what can I share with everyone? Something that everyone can take back after I say the end or my conclusion. I want something or some type of insight and encouragement that I can provide to everyone. When I say everyone, music majors, non-music majors, students, parents, instructors, everyone, something that we all can, can take bits and pieces away and apply to our lives. So, um, I decided to talk about um, something that is one of the, one of the things I'm passionate about, and I think are is very important in our day to day life, and this maximizing our gifts. And a lot of times, a lot of us are gifted in many different ways. We can do, we can play multiple instruments, we can paint, we can draw, we can sing, we can design, we can dance. There's so many things, so many gifts that we have. Um, some of us have not tapped into them like we should. Some of them have, uh, some of us have pushed them to the side and some of us have not reached our fullest potential as to how far we should be or where we should be going with our gifts. So I wanted to talk about maximizing our gifts or maximizing your gifts. Um, the three types of maximizations that I want to talk about is contributed maximization, acquired maximization and individualized maximization. And during the, speak, the speakers that came through the, the past few weeks, the high school directors um, that I earlier mentioned uh, spoke of their programs and their leadership, how to run their programs, and even the requirements to hold or maintain um, leadership positions in their program. And all of those requirements that are in place to assist those students is helping them to maximize their gifts. Um, everyone's director from wherever you're from or um, leaders even your current band directors at some point has assisted you with one of those types of types of maximizations. But there comes a time where it is up to you or up to us to maximize our gifts on our own. And we must take responsibility for our own gifts in our future, which we'll talk about that further, further along. Um, the first type of maximization I, I mentioned earlier, I'm going to expound on is contributed maximization. And contributed maximization is where you give knowledge and to an individual or, or group by teaching them new ideas or something that you are very knowledgeable about and provide a platform for them to experience and grow through trial and, and error. So um, while talking about this, I said, well, what kind of examples can I use I can definitely um, give my personal experiences with um, how I use these type of maximizations. And as you all know, and you heard that I currently teach at Luther Nick Gerald's Middle School. 
I began the contributed maximization process actually with my sixth grade band students. Um, and I've done, I've done it in choir, but since I currently teach band, I'll talk about band. So with my band students, when they first join, um, they probably think I'm probably the most craziest, most interesting, silly, weird, I don't know. I'm probably all of the above when it comes to band and music, but it's okay. I'll, I'll own it. <laughs> tell my students that when they walk into the room, probably the first or second day, I tell them that if you're not serious about learning an instrument and playing in the future, this may not be the class for you. And they're looking at me like, mm -hmm. but I, I'm kind of serious about that. Um, I tell them in your hands, you have money makers. The instrument that you have in your hand, somebody around the world is traveling the world and performing on the instrument and making money and getting paid. And I also tell them that the instrument they have in their hands is a scholarship for them one day. I said, I tell them that there's no patty cake in this classroom. There's no plan around. Um, you have to know your why, why you're in here. What do you plan to do with this instrument? And so after I start to tell them the different wonderful things that you can do with the instrument, instead of just playing it in, cl in a classroom setting, I have, I have tried to broaden the horizons and let them know that there's more to it just coming in the classroom and playing. There's so many wonderful opportunities that um, you can do in sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and everything all the way up until high school and college. So, and I wanted to get that picture in their mind because when you have those pictures to identify with in your mind, that helps you with your effort and the, and the time that you put in to your instrument and the things that you do to get to the next point and the next level. So, and that's not the end of that maximization. I'm always constantly observing my students, just like they're probably always observing me and looking at me, what shoes I have on, you know, don't wear no J's in the classroom. The kids will definitely find out and tell you, oh my gosh, Ms. Waters, you got all the ones. I'm the same way, but I don't look at their clothes. I look at the student as a whole and, and how they're reacting and, and how they react, they react with each other, how they play their instruments. And I visualize, it may, may sound weird, but I visualize and I see them further down the road, what they may be like or what, what they're doing or how they're performing. I can, I can picture them on the stage performing and, and doing recitals and different things like that. So I happen to get a phone call on a particular day in my classroom. There's a sixth grade band class. I received a phone call in class. So if I were to receive a call, I always would, you know, answer the phone and then turn around and look and see what they're doing because that's the most time when kids want to be sneaky and extra middle school and everybody has been in middle school so you already know <laughs> you already know so I, I was observing the students and I was talking and then I, I heard some giggling and laughing going on I said what in the world are they doing what's going on so um this particular day when I heard all this laughing and giggling I looked across and I in my flute section in the sixth grade class and one of the flute players was standing up in front of the band class conducting and waving his arms like a professional conductor. And I looked at him, I said, hmm, he looked like he knows what he's doing. <laughs> he was, he had all the movements. He was cueing crashes and cueing crescendos and cueing everything. And there wasn't even music playing, but I knew what he was, I can tell what he was doing. And I said, okay, hmm. And so I was laughing on the phone. I kind of like, had to cover my mouth so you wouldn't see me, but I was laughing. It don't take much for me to laugh. So I was laughing. So after I finished my, my, um, my phone call, I got off the phone and the, the kids thought that I was going to be upset or that he was in trouble. So I had a straight face. I walked down in front of him and I stood, I stood, I was like, um, come here. He was like, ma'am, like, come on up here. Let, let me see. Let me talk to you a minute. And they were like, Ooh, and I was like, do what you did before. And he, he was like, Oh, he was like, oh, I'm not in trouble. Sure, I'll do it. Okay, I'm sure. So he he conducted again. He did it up the whole spiel, the whole everything. And in that moment, I said, boy, you was watching some good conductors. He had it, he had it down pat. So in my mind, I said, okay, how can I maximize this situation? How can I maximize his gift? And he was a phenomenal flute player. Um, he listened to the things I said and about practicing the chairs. He didn't want nobody to take his chair, and nobody did. He was one of those. So I said, I'm gonna maximize the situation. So I was thinking ahead, I'm going to have him warm up my sixth grade band. They weren't ready at the time for, you know, with them just starting, they weren't ready where I wanted to, them to be to release them, to have a student to, you know, count things off and conduct and warm them up. But eventually that's what I did with that student. 
And so the students were receptive of, receptive of him. If anybody was out of line, the students, his section, and others that respected him, got others behind them in line. So it was, it was, it was easy for him to flow and to lead as a sixth grader. And um, to maximize his gift, I had um, when the next, the following year, and I was just thinking ahead, I was like, well, what if, you know, I'm not here or something happens and I have to leave or I'm, I'm absent. Um, other occasions when I would miss and I would leave worksheets for my band students to do. And I know everybody has experienced that. They're playing every day and you're used to your structure playing every day. And then all of a sudden your teacher's not there and they hand over a worksheet. And then the sub is yelling at you as soon as you walk through the door you are not gonna to be too respectful because who are you? Why are you yelling at me? What is this that you're handing me? So these students were so passionate about playing and loving and I saw how much the enjoyment, I just did not wanna take a day away from them performing. So fast forward to seventh grade. This is the sixth grader that I was preparing. Fast forward to seventh grade. I had to play the national anthem at an event um, during the school day in my administration. They're so awesome. They always support and they make a way for me if I if there's an event or something I need to go to, they make accommodations for me so I'm able to do that. Woo! Shout out to the administration, the girls. And so, what happened? I I pulled the the, the young the young one, young guy to the side and I told him tomorrow I'm not going to be here. Don't tell nobody. But this is what I'm going to happen. I'm have this on the board. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. You know, on this song, I always have to talk to the trumpets about this part. Listen for that. I, I was giving him all the spill and everything. And he was soaking in. He was like, yes, ma'am. I know what you're talking about. Yes, ma'am. You're talking about measures. And he was, he was telling me exactly what I was talking about. So, and I, that made me comfortable. I said, okay, because it was the first time I've done it. So I was, um, I don't want them to miss the rehearsal because this particular rehearsal, we were preparing for festival. And that's another reason why I didn't want to really miss. So the, um, I mind you that when this particular class ha happens, it's during the lunchtime. So the door is open, um, kids are at lunch, the administration is in the cafeteria. So of course, everybody, they're used to hearing the band play every day because the door is mo more than likely going to be open. So they were playing, he was, he was conducting the rehearsals and my principal knowing that I was gone, heard the band playing during lunchtime, which was their class period. She was trying to figure out how and why in the world they were playing and where was the supervising adult. So the supervising adult was in the classroom. They were just on the side, they couldn't be seen. So as soon as you walk in, all you see are students playing and a student standing up in front of the band. And she told me she was about to flip because she didn't see an adult. And, but when she walked in, she saw my students engaged and she saw what was going on. The kids were playing the music, performing the music as if exactly how I wanted to go. And they were running the rehearsal. And I'm talking about a class of almost 40 kids running the rehearsal. Nobody's up out of their seat acting crazy. And she was so proud and in tears when she saw that. The leadership that I maximized starting in sixth grade with that one student and those same students that respected him and had his back continue on into seventh grade, they were able to conduct rehearsals while I'm not even there and go through everything that I, I asked them to. And because of that, of course, like middle school students love, they got pizza party and all these wonderful things that principals gave them. And that I saw a video clipping of it. It made me feel so great that that, that, that maximization had taken place in that classroom. And you know, there's myths about middle school kids and how bad they can be and how over the top they can be and this and this and this, but I always like to prove um, people wrong when it comes down to middle school, middle school students. You can get whatever you want out of those middle, middle school students when they know that you care, when they know that you want to maximize their gifts. And that's high school, middle school, elementary school, any student, when they know that you care, they will give you and do whatever you, they, you want them to do when it comes down to um, making you happy and doing the things that you ask. So that um, contributed maximization um, is an example and it, and it floats right into acquired maximization. And so acquired maximization is where a skill is learned, developed, mastered, and used. It does not happen quick, quickly for some and it's definitely a process. Um, daily, this student would warm up the band and he knew my expectations and I did not have to give many instructions after that growth took place, as I mentioned before. 
and it, there, that's where acquired maximization um, occurred. I could, um, and even the coolest thing, I, I could leave the classroom and go to the restroom. They wouldn't even know I'm gone. They, they would still be playing and they wouldn't know because they're so engulfed into what they're doing. And, and I loved it, um, that type of maximization. And uh, my final maximization that I want to talk about, which is another, um, another uh, I guess, experience you can say, is maximizing your personal gifts. So, um, and when I say personal gifts, I'm talking about outside of the normal, the usual marching band, concert band, or performance classes. Um, the classes that you may be required to, keep, to be in to keep your scholarship or things of that nature. Um, the question is, how can we maximize our gifts and take them to the next level? Some of you may play multiple, and I'm, also, I'm almost certain there's people on this call, members of the MBX that play more than one instrument. I'm almost certain because that's just, it just happens. Um, and so you have two instruments that you play, or maybe three, or maybe four, I'm, I may be wrong, you may play all of them, but how are you maximizing those skills that you have? How can you take them to the next level? Um, so an example could be of maximization of, of increasing your skills is sight reading musical pieces that you've never played before. Um, you can improve how well you play in a small group setting. Have you played with a smaller or chamber group or chamber ensemble, a smaller group of your, your peers? Have you performed by yourself on a stage with someone or where it's just you? Um, have you recorded a video and you know put it in a Facebook group and asked for feedback or, or how, how have you maximized your gifts? So in my experience it, as an undergraduate student, as you heard in on the bio, um, I signed up for brass ensemble and trumpet choir. I knew nothing about those ensembles. Um, when I first joined, but later I found out that um, in that ensemble, I gained more control in my playing. I learned how to adjust, adjust to a smaller group setting um, or chamber group compared to marching band. Marching band, you, I play loud. It was, you know, no one had to tell me to be quiet. That was the beautiful thing. I can play as loud as I wanted and it would fit because it was, you know, a trumpet. <laughs> But um, when you go into those other ensembles, that are those smaller groups, you have to adjust. You have to play more musical. You have to blend with others. And every little thing you do or every note you play, it has to blend or you're going to stick out. So that's what one of those things. Even in concert band, same thing. Um, you have to be cautious of how you play and perform because things can stick out. So I learned how to get in tune with players around me, watching body language they're breathing and eventually playing without the need of a conductor. So when you build that type of connection with a small group, um, it's a beautiful thing, especially in a chamber group. Um, as you heard, I joined the, the Fayetteville Jazz Express and a lot of my bandmates did at that time. And a lot of, a lot of them were not music majors. And the great, the cool thing about Dr. Finn, he would, um, he, they would always be jamming in that class. And I walked by and just stand there and look as the outsider. And it was like, you might, you might as well just come in and just, you know, sign up. I was like, you know what, you're right. So I remember everyone wanted to play. So sometimes tuba players would be signing up, baritones, the instruments you wouldn't normally see in a jazz setting, you would see in the jazz band because everybody wanted a piece of, of that, that style of music just to learn, learn about it. And when I first joined, I was in there playing straight eighth notes. And sometimes you cut off the song and I'm the, I'm the reason because I'm still playing... <laughs> straight eighth notes, but eventually I learned how to swing. So that was um, some things I was able to take from even being in the Jazz Express, learning how to improv and learning some jazz history and things that I did not know about. And it was great because um, I would tell anyone, um, the jazz or any chamber ensemble you can be a part of, um, you can create one yourself if, if it's not there or if you wanna create your own, Get a few peers and say, hey, let's get together. I saw this book of music and, or I saw these etudes. Let's sight read and see what we can do. Let's record and see what we sound like. So there's so many things that you can maximize your gifts with, even with your peers, to grow musically, get all that you can get. Um, and before I graduated uh, FSU, I was, I was really concerned about my trumpet skills and my playing and everything that I acquired because the senior recital had happened 
And as it got to close time for graduation, I'm like, okay, how in the world, if I'm teaching, how in the world am I going to continue playing this instrument? Because I thought about my mother, she purchased two instruments and sacrificed to get them. You know, I grew up in the country and some of you all that grew up in the country is, is the different type of life. It's just different. And um, my parents, my family wasn't wealthy. So I knew as appreciation, I needed to continue playing. And um, so I, I was concerned. I was kind of leery and scared that as soon as I start working, as soon as I start getting into my career, I may not play my instrument as much. So I told myself, and I literally made a declaration, I am promised that no matter where I end up in my career or location, I have to play my trumpet for the rest of my life. I may get rusty sometimes, or whatever, whatever it may be, but I must play my trumpet for the rest of my life or however long I, long I can. And so when I was teaching choir, I fell in a rough patch because it's choir. Like I, I don't, I don't say, hey everyone, I want you to sing this song. I'm gonna put my trumpet with you. It just would have been an awkward situation. So when I was teaching choir, I didn't play my trumpet as much as as I wanted to during the day and different things like that. So I will never forget. I was a new teacher on the block. And of course, when you're a new teacher, sometimes, especially a choral teacher, they want to see what you got, what you're made of. And it's okay, we got a new choir teacher. Okay, so hey, we have some games. Um, can you sing the national anthem for this, this sporting event or for this game? I'm like, mm, what? So I'm like, okay, sure. I'm like, I'm, I, mean, I don't think I should say no because I'm the choir teacher. So I should be able to sing the national anthem. And so, um, I really didn't want to do it. I really didn't. Um, no re disrespect to our country, um, but I am not a fan of singing the national anthem because it's a difficult song to sing. You have to really be a legit amazing singer to sing the national anthem. And at that time, there were some bad renditions and some viral videos at the time of people that did not do too well the national anthem. So that was another thing I did not want to be the next viral video of a national anthem going wrong. <laughs> so I didn't want to be next. So one particular game, I literally lost my voice. I was scared a little bit. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't sing. And this is the day of the game. And I'm like, how in the world? I don't know anyone else to sing the national anthem. So I agreed the prior day and I could not talk. I could barely talk. So I had to figure out something. And thank God that particular day, I had drove my trumpet to work with me that day. And um, I remembered I brought my trumpet and um, I planned, um, the way I planned it, I said, well, let me practice and see if I can play this trumpet. I, earlier on in the day, I said, let me practice and see if I can play the national anthem on this trumpet. Because I remember playing it in college. And I said, if I can play it, then maybe that will get through. So I was practicing going through the melody. And you'll be surprised when you don't play something for a while, how some things never leave you. They never leave you. And so I started to play, I closed my eyes. I closed, made sure all the doors in the hallway, all the doors were closed because I was like, I'm not embarrassing myself. I looked out in the hallway, made sure no one was looking. And, um, and, and I checked and I made some sounds to see if anybody you know, came out the corner somewhere. So I was like, okay, nobody's here. So I closed all the doors and I went and I went to practicing and I went to back corner of my classroom and I practiced and I said, okay. And I played the whole thing. I said, all right, I think this is gonna be okay. So now I got to tell them that I can't sing. So I went down to the gym early and um, I told them, I said, hey, I don't have my voice and I'm supposed to sing the, sing the national anthem, but in your script, right, um, the playing of the national anthem said the singing. So it came about and it said, um, now we'll have the our um, now we'll have the playing of our national anthem by our choral choral teacher, Mr. Reed Ward. And I thought it sounded so funny because a choral teacher is playing the national anthem. <laughs> so I played it, and everyone was shocked that a trumpet could sound the way that it did. And in my mind, I said, I want to play. I would rather play this song instead of singing it. It's better for me to sing through this instrument vers versus me literally singing it. And um, that concept was taught to me by my, my college band director, Mr. Timothy Chambers. He always told us to sing through, through our instruments. Don't just you know play notes, sing through our instruments. So 
from that point on, I carry that, that trumpet with me every day. Um, and my goal that it was to play, um, I definitely made sure that I had it with me at all times. But um, and then eventually inquire my students. Um, I was able to work with my students and get them prepared to sing the national anthem. So that was great because I didn't want to play all the time. I really wanted my students to be involved. So it, we got to the point where my students were singing it. Um, harmonies were there. It was just a great opportunity for me to give them, give them exposure. And so um, it began happening over the years. The more that I played, the better um, I got. I was starting to get more stronger like I was before in college. So it was great that I started maximizing my, my potential. And after that, the national anthem kept going. I kept playing and then um, somebody, my, my coworker gave me a newspaper article about the woodpeckers and they were doing auditions for singers. And he was like, you should do this. I was like, no, I'm not gonna do this. They want singers, I'm not doing that. And so he's like, just do it. Just, I was like, okay, since you asked me, I'm going to do it. But in my mind, I was like, I'm not gonna make the cut. So I, in my mind, I was like, I just, I'm gonna play just enough where I told him I would do it and ended up, I got called back. And so the opportunities continue to grow with playing and performing where a, for, fit, for a 50 to a few hundred people um, playing in front of that amount of crowd, it started to get into the thousands. And I never thought that that it would, you know, increase to that getting into the thousands. So at that point, um, I was able to play for Cumberland County Schools for their, their kick, uh, kickoff celebration for the 2019-2020 school year. And that was, I think, between seven and 10,000 teachers. And that was like, wow, I never thought that I would perform just me by myself in front of that many people. And that was the, one of the greatest experiences um, that I've, I've experienced by you know, maximizing my gifts, being able to do that. That's something I thought I would never be able to do. Marching band was fun, easy. I was in a uniform, we all wore the same thing. No one could really pick me out unless you really, really knew me. But to stand by myself in front of thousands and thousands of people and play the national anthem, it was an honor and it was a privilege. And, and I, I was grateful for that, to be able to do that. And, and also, uh, you never know who's watching as far as young students or um, or children who's watching you because they even may want to play an instrument one day or may, they may even be watching you and say, wow, that looks cool. I want to do that too. So it's important as when you maximize your gift, you got to think about these few things that you're doing. You're, uh, you're advocating for music. Every time you pick your instrument up, you're advocating. Every time that you are um, rehearsing or every time that you're in a parade or wherever you are, you're advocating for music. You're recruiting people for that very program. There's so many stories where children that are now, and it may be, even be your story where you saw this particular band every year during the holidays marching down, marching down the street and you wanted to do the same thing and they inspired you to want to play an instrument or they inspire you to play that uh, certain instrument. And those type of things you have to keep in mind every time you pick up your instrument, every time that you play, everything that you do, how am I maximizing my potential? How am I giving back? Are you tutoring a young person? Have you visited a local high school? Um, have you thought about making an album? Have you um, gathered with um, some of your peers? Have you even taught private trumpet lessons or private clarinet lessons, flute, whatever instrument you have, what have you done to maximize your gift or to give back and, and spread the word to others uh, about music and how music is important. And I was able to see, unfortunately, um, when this pandemic happened, I was able to, I was in a Facebook group with different music directors and band directors, choral directors. Some schools after the pandemic happened going into the, this, this current school year, they cut music programs because they didn't see, they didn't understand the importance of music and they cut the programs and moved and shifted people around, sent them to other places instead of you know, trying to continue music because they, they don't understand or see the importance. So it's important for all of us, every time we pick up an instrument to advocate, um, to give back, to provide um, insight, information about, um, about music and I'm going to share 
one more story, and I'm not going to try not to get teary eyed when I share it, but it just shares um, shows how someone maximized for me um, to, for me to become the person that I am, the musician that I am today. It was a small little seed, a small little sacrifice, a small gesture that inspired me to become a trumpet player. And it started when I was six years old, six years old. And of course it was in church. <laughs> it was in church, like probably was several of my experiences, but um, I went, my mom took me to a revival, uh, my sister and I, and we went to this church and the pastor was behind the pulpit playing a trumpet and, with the band and the music was awesome. It sounded good. And it caught my ears and eyes. And I, at that time I had no idea what it was. And my mom didn't know either. So after service, she took me up to the altar this time, not for prayer. <laughs> she took me up to the altar and um, she asked the pastor the question, like, what, what was that thing, that gold thing in your hand that you were playing? And he was like, oh, and his, his name was Reverend Brown. He said, oh, this, this is a trumpet. And he was like, she was like, oh, okay, my daughter, she, she was very excited and wanted to see what that was. She, she really liked what, how, you, how it sounded. And he looked at me, he said, you want to play this? I was like, yes. And so I looked at my mom, I didn't even get approval. She was like, no, it's okay. And you know how after church, those who go to church, you know, after church, um, a lot of people want to greet the pastor and everything. And there was a line. He left the line, went to the back, cleaned the mouthpiece, brought it back and handed it to him. He said, he showed me how to buzz. And I, I got it just like that, six years old. Then he put the mouthpiece on the trumpet and told me what, how to hold it and everything. And I was able to produce a sound just like that. At six years old and he was he was even amazed and he asked my mom if I played before she was like no she didn't even know what that was and he was like wow she need to be a trumpet player and from that moment I, it was six years later until I played another one but just that seed that he planted taking that moment he could have said my mom could have said no we're going home or he could have said hold on I gotta speak to a few more people no he stopped right then and there maximized his gifts as a preacher, he could have easily said, I'm a pastor now. I'm not going to play this instrument. I need to focus on my church. I need to do these things. But no, he took that moment, that little moment, and shared with me and showed me how to play the trumpet and showed me um, that moment that it is possible. And so um, just recently, he passed away on Saturday, and I boohoo cried like a baby because I thought about that moment that he sacrificed and took that time and maximized his own gifts to pour into me. And thankfully, I can say that I gave back and I was able to um, play for him at his church and thank him. I even had lunch with him, you know, prior to him passing away. And it's, I just want to show you how important it is to, even if a young child or someone comes up to you or looks at your instrument and seems interested, share, share with them about it. Tell them what it is, because you never know you're maximizing, already starting something inside of that child early on, where it may seem like they may, may not understand, but they do. And they don't forget, we don't forget as children. And I know all of you have your own story and your own experiences of, with maximizing. So in conclusion, I wanna say to, and ask you this, how are you going to maximize your gifts? And I know everyone up here does not play an instrument, you're here supporting me, but you may sing. Like I said, you may be an artist, you may draw, you may be good with you know, counseling and talking to people. You may be good with decorating. You may be great with arts and crafts. There's so many things, so many gifts you have, but a lot of us are sitting on our gifts and someone is waiting just for you to open their eyes or share the greatness of your gift or expose them to wonderful things. So think about everything you do on your instrument. It opens doors for contributed, acquired, an individual maximization. Everything that you do, maximize your gifts. Share your gifts. Advocate for music. Let's keep music alive. Music is a gift that keeps on giving. I was blessed to have, I'm blessed to have a principal that was a trombone player in school. So she understands the importance of music. But a lot of times, some people don't know until you share and expose them to me what music can do for you and the greatness of music. So I'm going to bring this to a close. And um, I just wanted to share that because it's, I'm very passionate. I love education, but I, I also am, 
I'm very, I love seeing gifted young people doing great things and playing instruments and, and being excited about music in any way that I can advocate and maximize. Um, I want you to join me in that process and let's keep music alive. Let's keep uh, music alive in schools um, because it brings joy. And I know, I know it brings joy to you just like it brings joy to me. And I just wanted to say, let us all, no matter what you're doing, no matter what your gifts are, let's maximize our gifts. Thank you so much. And I'll open up the floor for any questions that you may have. Um, and I'll turn it back over to uh, Dr. Reed and you can take it from there. Thank you Thank again. You. Let's, let's come off of mute and just uh, let's go ahead and give a round of applause. That was definitely what they call a rainbow. Yeah. You know, now that was definitely a word, you know, uh, about using your talents. And, and, and you know, class, um, for, for those of you who may have considered going to another school other than an HBCU, you should know that HBCUs always and often give opportunities for you to use your talents. Just like uh, uh, Ms. Waters, we have a lot of students that are currently still continuing your legacy that are in the choir, that are in main attraction, that are in the band. Uh, I think I saw Jamar Young on here, you know, so you have, you know, and I can tell you uh, as an HBCU graduate and going to, um, a PWI where you really wouldn't get that opportunity to be able to express yourself and express your talents, express all of you know these talents or be able to stand in front of an ensemble and conduct. You know, so I appreciate you sharing that. So uh, we'll open the floor for uh, questions. And uh, let's see, Prof Chalmers is on and he's uh, sometimes uh, served as the moderator uh, for the um, Q and A. And then I'm gonna go ahead and mute as I monitor the matrix. All right, appreciate that, Dr. Reed. Um, we're gonna open up the floor for questions um, for Mrs. Waters. Also too, if you wanna um, post a question in the chat, you can do that as well. And I will um, read it uh, for you. So you feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question. Uh, hey, Mrs. Hello, Mrs. Waters. <laughs> Hello. Um, I know your topic today was maximizing our gifts, whether contributed gifts, act, acquired gifts, or individual gifts. So my question is, how do you make sure your students are continuous, continuously increasing their gifts and their attention is fully focused? That's a great question. I, um, the way I make sure that my students are continuously um, using their gifts and I, I like, I have conversations with them um, because I want to know their mind, their, where they're thinking, where their mind is and, and why they do the things they do or how their practice is going and who are they're listening to. Um, a lot of times students are just playing instruments and, and actually, and I hope I heard your question correctly because it was kind of low, but um, they haven't really listened to many artists or, you know, or listen to someone who plays their instrument or try to actually explore other things in their, in their um, playing. So what I've done, I've actually um, given things to the side. Or I, I pull certain students to the side and I say, hey, I want you to take this, play this part, play this here, then this here. And I want you to email, email it to me, a video. I'm gonna give you this amount of time and I want to hear what you have from it and how you're playing. And then I give them feedback. Sometimes um, students send me emails personally and say, Ms. Waters, can you listen to this? Or is this right? And I love when I get that type of interaction with those stu my students because I know that they are still continuing. They are still um, practicing. They are still interested in what they're doing. So those type of things are important when you're 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 um, dealing with students, especially at that young the younger stages, when it comes to playing. And I know with middle school we only learn six scales, but our I give my my eighth graders all the twelve scales because I guess what they're going to high school. Why do they have to wait to get to high school before they start to learn their skills or all of their skills or getting into minor minor skills? So that's um, a way that I personally try to um, make sure that they continue um, the process, the learning process and maximizing their potential. 
I even currently have a student now that she will be playing in Las Vegas next year at an open mic, mic event where she will get a chance to learn to improv and different things. So I'm excited about working with her with that. And I'm just amazed that they're already starting and she's going to get paid. They're already starting to um, perform. You don't have to wait until you get to be an adult to perform. Because I started, I had my first job at the age of 10 playing piano. So I, I always tell my students that you don't have to be an adult to to let that instrument um, open up doors for you. It depends on what you put into it and how far you want to go. And their, your instrument will take you there. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Ms. Waters. Uh, I just want to start by saying thank you for speaking with us today. It was very encouraging and I learned a lot and it gave me a lot of encouragement. And I know um, like a couple weeks ago, we talked about a lot of black female directors that were in the communities or in the surrounding cities. And I know with you being a black female director and also playing a trumpet, which is also a very male dominated instrument. So yeah. I'm pretty sure you probably had your fair share of that adversity, but I just wanted to know what helped you stay focused and be able to go through what you were going through to be the best player you could be despite the outside forces trying to discourage you. <laughs> That's a good question. And you know, when I first started playing the trumpet, I didn't count the cost of that it was a male dominated instrument, even though I saw a male playing it at a young age, I just wanted to play that instrument. So um, what I did, I my mom started me early on when I was taking piano lessons. Uh, she taught me early on the importance of humility and being humble and um, you you still have, you always have somewhere to grow and um, somewhere to go and never feel like you're high and mighty where you cannot be taught. And that's something that I've always kept with me. So yes, um, even a freshman player, and I didn't want, I didn't want the principal chair. I didn't want that, like, to be honest. And when he made me play the part, I was like, oh, no, because I felt the pressures of all these guys in the section, all these people that were here already playing and I'm a freshman, I'm playing first part, I'm playing this in this chair. So it was a lot of pressure, but what I did, I always use kindness and I always try to be kind because I didn't want nobody being mean to me <laughs> playing this instrument. So I always try to be kind and encouraging and I never try to be out in the forefront. I always like to be in the back unless, you know, something is needed, but I always try to stay low key. Even now, I try to stay low key. Um, as an adult and just try my best to be helpful and be kind as much as I can. And um, any, if there's any negativity or anything that's said, um, I channel it out or use it as fuel to strengthen myself as a player, um, to strengthen myself as um, a performer. So um, as far as negativity, um, being a female section leader and playing trumpet at that time, that was kind of tough because you, know, you had those young players, well, I did this in all county and I got this in all district. There's no girl has never played better than me. And you know, they, people were very verbal. I was like, well, I understand, you know, well, as you learn and grow, some things happen and you may meet a female that may play better than you, but that doesn't mean that you can't play better than her. You know, I would always tell them like, I'm not trying to be all of that and everything. I just love playing my instrument. So um, other than that, it's awkward. Sometimes um, playing in um, ensembles like the Fable Jazz Ensemble or Fable Jazz Orchestra, I'm the only female. <laughs> so it's sometimes performances and concerts are awkward because it's like you want to have conversations, but it's like you don't really understand the body you're saying. I'm like, well, it's nice outside today. The weather is nice. So, <laughs> so there's not many conversations I can have or relate to, but it's still a great experience, a learning experience. And thankfully, I haven't had anything that has been um, detrimental or hurtful to my, my, um, my process of playing and, and growing. So, um, those are just have been little run-ins, but I try to show the, you know, the comment, they say, kill them with kindness. It works for me. <laughs> it works for me. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, Ms. Waters, if I may. Yes, sir, Mr. Pratt. Yes, I, yeah. I, uh, I definitely want to say uh, thank you for the burst of energy that my program have received over the last couple of years. I mean, it's been it's been rewarding to feel the the energy that's growing in our program because of the work that you're doing. 
spend 15 years before you guys there, whatever. I've been dealing with some things that have been kind of pulling me, pulling me down and all that. But the energy I feel from the students that you're sending me, I truly, truly appreciate you for that. And I just had to let you know, I talk about you all the time in my class and I appreciate just, uh, you know, the kids just loving you and talking about you and I'm hearing it all the time. That is what E.E. E. Smith has been missing for a very long time. So I want to say thank you to you. And also I have not, I'm a trumpet player as well. And I love listening to the timbre of a trumpet player. And I'm, I'm, I walked into a gym when you guys were playing, you was doing the national anthem and I walked in and man, did I get blown away. I was like, whose tone is this? Who is playing? And it happened to be you. And what a beautiful sound. I think there's, I don't think there's too many people that got a, a better sound than me, but you definitely have a better sound. You are singing through your instrument. And, you know, I, I, I say Winton is better than me. And now I'm also going to say you are better than me uh, on that trumpet. Your sound is incredible. You sing through the instrument and I recorded it and I still got it and I listen to it all the time. So Ooh, don't kudos, share it, don't share it. <laughs> kudos to you and uh, thank you for what you do and who you are. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pratt. Thank you so much. I'm just happy to be your feeder for you. Um, it was hard while you're talking. Like I said before, I taught uh, choir for five years and I'm right next door to the band room. So it was really tough teaching choir, being next to the band and, you know, wanting to play or wanting to hear certain things. And it's like, oh, it's not my program. I can't do anything. So um, I was excited to finally be able to, you know, feed into your program and, and give back. And it's been such a joy working with you and, and all the great things you've done to assist me with the program. I really, really appreciate you for that. Um, I definitely thank you so much. Certainly. And I've done nothing but nod my head saying thank you. I ain't done nothing. It's all you. Don't, don't throw it on me. Mr. Pratt, come on, share this. <laughs> I have a question. So, um, firstly, I want to thank you for, for doing this, this master class with us. It's very informative. Um, but being an educator who, who is um, outside of, I guess, your primary, because I've heard you say, you know, you play instruments um, and choirs, not, not your first thing that you would uh, or at least before it's not your first thing that you would do. Being an educator that's outside of your comfort zone, how do you feel um, about influencing your students and, and giving opportunities? What are some of those things that you have to step outside of to make sure that your students meet you know, their, their own goals? What are some of the things that you do outside of that? So are you talking about when I was teaching choir? Yes. Okay. Um, the things that I uh, did outside of my comfort zone, um, one was singing. <laughs> Even though I was in those ensembles, it was I was blending with people. But when I had to demonstrate a note, I was like, okay. And sometimes I would try to play it on the piano first. I'm like, okay, sopranos hit this note. <laughs> and then they didn't hit it. I'm like, oh, okay, let me get a microphone. Me, me, me. And I try to, you know, sing. <laughs> <laughs> I would try to sing the note and that's why a lot of times I, my, I probably lost my voice and had vocal issues because it just wasn't I'm, a, I'm an instrumental player so um what I did I I would I expose them to other types of singers um during that time when I was teaching um and the way I recruited for my choir to get to get some amazing singers I would have all my general music and my choirs to sing. All my general music student classes sung. And so what happened, they didn't know it, but I was scouting. I would have vocal tests and everything. I said, okay, guys over here, um, I want you to sing this and I'll play the piano and I was like, sing this. And so some of those guys, I was like, what you doing in general music? I was like, you know what, don't worry about it. I was like, ma'am, I was like, no, I'm gonna call your parent. And next thing you know, they were, I put them in another, another in, the, in the choral class. And I had a whole rack of tenors. Those are the strongest tenors I've ever seen in my life. And they were, they were singing. Woo! If you, if you know no better, you thought I had a church choir. I had them three-part harmonies and everything. I get excited thinking about it. Um, so when I, um, I would expose them to, so one particular kid, he was phenomenal. 
I taught him in general music how to read and I heard him sing. I was like, uh-uh, you're not gonna be in this class no more. And he was upset with me because I called his mother and I got his schedule changed. He was upset because he wanted to still take Spanish. I was like, boy, you already bilingual. Why do you need, to you're gonna be in choir. So um, what I did, I um, changed the schedule. And the first day he was in my class, the bell ringer, I had up there was the group, the Pentatonics. And when he, and I had, I had them to listen to it and analyze and tell me what they heard, what did they hear musically? And we, we talked about, it, discussed it. And when he heard the Pentatonics, I was like, oh. that's all, that's all it took. He was my best reader, my best sight reader, my best singer. He even corrected the ones in his section. He's like, man, you're going, you're getting flat. You need to, um, he was, I didn't even have to say nothing to the tennis section. He, no problems at all. And guess what? He's majoring in music education. <laughs> He's majoring in music education. I have several students that even were, that were in choir majored in music education. I even had a student that, um, and it's funny, I had a student that every time I call out a song for the choir to sing, she will always sing her note before I started. So I didn't say nothing, but I eventually, I don't have perfect pitch, but if I play it long enough, the relative starts to work. So I was listening, I was like, hmm, okay. So I was like, nah, 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 this is seventh grade, nah, nah. So kept going, kept going, a few weeks. I did this for a few weeks because I could not believe it. And so about a month went by and she was always singing her pitch before we started. I said, okay. I said, young lady, um, I need you to stay after class for, with me for a moment. And so I spoke with her. I said, um, do you know what perfect pitch is? You no, know, what's that? I said, that's exactly what you have. Me? What is that? Okay. Every time before we get ready to sing a song, you do this. And when you sing the note, I match on the piano and you're right every time. That means you have perfect pitch. She's like, huh? I said, it's okay. Don't worry about it. But what you do I was giving her tips and things to keep fine tuning her gift and just strengthening it. And on top of that, she played guitar. So I was just giving her tips and things like that to strengthen her gift and not to let anything taint it and, and just keep working on it, keep that gift sharp. Cause I said, honey, nobody, hardly anyone gets that. That's like a dime a dozen. So when you get it, you work with it and you keep, keep going. So I had some wonderful, actually wonderful experiences in choir. I had a lot of serious singers, just like I do in band, that um, were very serious. When they walked on the stage in middle school, you could hear a pin drop. They were serious about performing. Like they, they really, I made, I set the tone for them, even though I was like, they had no idea. I hardly knew what I was doing. <laughs> no idea. But I, I said that I'm going to give my students the best that I have. So I was calling on Dr. Payton. She even gave me, when she retired from teaching middle school, she gave me a lot of her material. So I had um, a lot of great mentors that helped me along the way because I was, I was scared as I don't know what, because I, I was planning to teach band and it didn't happen. But I'm glad for the experience because it made me grow stronger as um, an educator. If I'm going to assist anybody, where, whether it comes to choral music, whether it's band, anything instrumental, I can assist because I've been there and I've done that. So there's no questions at all my, <laughs> my answering in that area. And I love to encourage those, even those that cannot find a band job um, right when you graduate. Okay, time to explore, let's go. <laughs> let's do and see the best thing, see and do the best that you can do. I hope to answer your question because I can ramble sometimes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Waters, I have a question. Hey, okay. Ms. Waters. Um, I have a question. So what did you feel you had to strengthen the most about yourself prior to becoming a music educator? Hmm. The thing I think I had to strengthen the most about myself, and I'm still working on it, is um, my confidence playing a male-dominated instrument and my confidence in my abilities. Um, especially being around um, a lot of males that may do it or um, those, it's, it's like the, the women that talked about it, you have to go extra and above and beyond 
they are so right about that. Um, it is so true. And I feel like I have to go um, take, if one person takes five steps, I feel like I have to take 50 steps. It's so much, sometimes there's a lot of pressure because I, I want to get everything, everything in place, everything right where it needs to be. So um, it's challenging at times, but it's like sometimes I have to step away, think things through and, and plan properly and, and pop myself down and build myself back up encourage your, you know, the song, encourage yourself. Yep. Yeah, all, all of that. <laughs> Have to definitely encourage yourself um, in, in the process because sometimes it may feel like a lonely road when you, your own mind can create different things, you know, within itself. So you have to channel those things out and, you know, find the positives um, and be the best you that you can be. Just be the best. Only All you can do is be you and do what you can do. And I have to remind myself that all the time. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Miss Waters? Yes. How do you build your improvisation skills? Ooh, that's a great question. The way I build my improvisation skills, but I'm always constant, constantly building, is by listening. Listening to so many different jazz artists. I listen to gospel, jazz. I listen to saxophone players. I listen to flautists. I listen to guitar players, improving. I listen to everybody. I listen to classical. I listen to rock. I listen to pop. I listen to everything. And I try to emulate and copy exactly what I hear. Um, Miles Davis is one of my favorite ones. Well, first, Louis Armstrong. That was the first CD my mom brought me. And anybody that's raised in the church, you understand, you know, how that goes. So I was shocked when I got that CD. <laughs> it was Louis Armstrong. So, um, and I wore that thing out. I, I listened to a lot of different um, artists and different styles. And I tried to emulate. And a lot of times, if I'm not able to play, if I'm driving, which I'm working on it sometimes I do. <clears throat> I, I play um, and emulate what the, the artist is doing or what the singer is doing on my instrument. Um, I, I, tran I transcribe or, or purchase transcriptions when I don't feel like transcribing myself. <clears throat> I, I purchase transcriptions and also um, play those and learn those. So there's so many different ways that I work on my improvisational skills. Um, and then step aside and improv on your own. Don't play behind any music. Don't play behind any chords. Pick up your instrument and play, play your, put your feelings out there. Put your feeling, whatever you're feeling inside, put it through that instrument. And there's been times where I played and performed and I know what I was feeling inside. I was having a down day, but I didn't, it didn't, I didn't think it came across on my instrument, but there was times that I played my instrument and after I finished tears was going down my face and people in the audience were crying too. So it's, it's a powerful thing, um, but put yourself in your instrument, whatever you're feeling, play it, see what you can do. Even if you take a scale or learn your blues scale and then start adding things onto the blues scale. Also reading, learning about reading jazz charts. Dr. Finn, yeah. that's, he really helped me with that. Dr. Finn is that guy, okay? The knowledge he has, I said, I'm so glad that I, I was standing by that door and listening because he's, he's the one who started me with improv -ing. And then when, when the percussion ensemble and the, the brass ensemble were doing songs and stuff together, I think that was one of the first times I improv by myself. And I was shocked that the notes that came out, well, I was like, oh, how in the world did I? And it was just what came out and what I felt that came out of the instrument. So start there, start there listening. Do as much listening as you can to uh, so many different artists and try to emulate what you hear. Thank you so much. Welcome, Bestie. <laughs> I'm Ms. Waters. Hi. What would you say for somebody who has a gift, um, but is shy about their gift um, because they don't sound like others or you know they're not as good as others, but they, they but you know they have a gift. Mm. That sounds like kind of like um, I, that has happened a few times. You can't compare, and I had to learn that myself. You cannot compare yourself to others 
And that's the issue that I had because I'm like, I'm already female. I don't sound like this person. I don't sound like this or I don't sound like that. But you can't compare yourself to others. You have to do what you can do and give it your best. Give it your best because when you compare you, when you waste your time comparing yourself to others and feeling the way you feel about, you know, um, how they think about how you're sound or this and that, you you take the energy off of the you take away the energy that you can place inside your gift. When I first came to Fayetteville, I didn't want anybody to know that I played piano. But I didn't want anybody to know I was a musician because where I came from, I'm like, man, these singers, this style, the way they play, I don't want them to know I play nothing because they probably think I'm horrible. You know, because when I heard these, I was like, "Ooh, of course. But I was like, nope, I'm not going to let anyone know that I play. And I thought I was the only one in the Rosenthal building. I was, you know, I was looking down the hall. You know, that hall is kind of tricky. So I was like, nobody here? Okay. Went into the door, played, and I was playing around and enjoying the piano, the acoustics, everything. The pianos had just got tuned, I think, that time. And somebody knocked on my door. I was like, and so, but it was good that it happened because that person begged me so many times to play at their church. So many, so many times. I was like, no, I'm not. But I finally did. But I actually it was a growing and learning experience. Found I didn't know Robinson County existed. So I ended up playing in Robinson County for 10 years in the good old country church, learning and growing and was able to, you know, maximize my gifts there. And it's important to, even if you don't, feel like you're good enough or feel like you're you're the type of musician or or up to a certain status that doesn't matter what matters is that you giving it your all and if you love to perform if you love to play or whatever instrument it is that's all that matters if it makes you happy on the inside you're doing the right thing give it your all you'll be just fine i hope that answered your question <laughs> All right, I have a quick question. Uh, again, like everybody has said all, so far, uh, thank you for, for sharing uh, uh, your time with us. We do appreciate it. Uh, so as Mr. Pratt was talking earlier, he was saying that your tone is, is really great. So what are some tips that you would give to uh, everyone watching on how to uh, improve their tone? That way they have a characteristic sound and uh, something that uh, listeners will want to listen to more. Hmm. Uh, that's a great question. And when people keep saying your tone, your tone, I, sometimes I'm, it took me a while, I'm gonna be honest, it took me a while to hear what they heard. Cause I'm like, I just sound like a trumpet. Like, what do you mean with my tone? When I auditioned at Federal State for um, a scholarship my, before my freshman year began, and I was planning to be a, a piano major. I wasn't planning to ma major in trumpet. She talked me into it. But um, he was like, and I played, guess the song I played? I played the Star Spangled Banner, it's funny. Um, I played the Star Spangled, <laughs> Star Spangled Banner to audition. And she's like, oh, you have a wonderful tone. I'm like, tone? And I just, I didn't hear, I didn't think that my tone was what it was. But um, to go back in my, in high school, my second band director was a female band director. And guess what instrument she played? Trumpet. And so when we, our band was small. When I say my school was small, we only had one high school. My graduating class was 67 people. So that's, um, that's, how, that's how country I am. So um, she would play with us. Every time our, we would play, she would stand right beside me and play and, and everything. And her, she had an amazing tone as well. And every time she would play, I'm playing with it. And I'm trying to match and do everything she did. When she went to a high note, I was like, oh. I turned, I would try to go to her. So everything she did, I would try to emulate what she did and what I heard. And I believe my, my tone developed from the, that point. Shout out to Miss Smith. Well, Shawan, Miss Shawanda, because her name changed. But um, listening to her. And also, like I said before, with the improvisation, listening to artists and very good artists that have smooth tone. I love smooth tone. I never liked the, the over the edge sound. I like smooth tone. And, and um, also my band director in college, Mr. Timothy Chambers would always tell us to sing through the instrument. So I would try my best because he would always fuss about that, singing through the instrument. So I would always hear, I would always try my best to sing through the instrument. And um, also um, the warm ups and things that you do are very important. And I tell them, like I tell my students, um, this is a muscle and you can't 
put your running shoes on randomly and go outside and like, all right, I'm gonna run 10 miles today. Let's go. You're not going, you can't do that. You won't do that because you have to condition yourself. You have to condition your body. You have to constantly stretch. You have to constantly run smaller distances and add them as you go until you get to those 10 miles or until you reach your goal. So the warming up is very important. Keeping this muscle limber, keeping, you can't, you shouldn't take no off days. I gave an assignment to my student, a warm up assignment, and it says on the top, only do these warm ups when you, um, the days that you eat. And you think about that, warm up every day. <laughs> warm up every day. It's a part of your life. If you brush your teeth, and I told somebody else the other day, I said, you know what? I need to get it together. If I'm brushing my teeth every day, I need to be doing this. I need to be doing that. I need to be warming up every day. I need to be doing this every day. So the same thing, it needs to be a part of your life, a part of your life. And when it's a part of your life and it's what you do, that's how you strengthen your tone. That's how you strengthen your breathing. That's how you strengthen your control. That's how you strengthen your performance. That's how you strengthen everything. The whole performer, the whole player, the whole musician as a whole, that's how you keep it locked at all times by it being a part of your life, your everyday life. You can't put it down and pick it up. Can't put it down and pick it up. Can't put it because you won't be consistent. And then you have to rebuild again and then rebuild again. So to have consistency, it needs to be a part of your life part of everything that you do. I hope to answer your question. <laughs> Thank you. I You're appreciate welcome. it. You're welcome. All right. Do we have any more uh, questions for Mrs. Mrs. for Ms. Waters? Okay. Um, we appreciate everything that in the message you've given us today, uh, Ms. Waters. Um, you know, extremely talented, very versatile. And I think the students really appreciate all the different areas you were able to speak from. And, um, you know, we really are really grateful to have you as an FSU alum, um, carrying, um, you know, the FSU and MBX name everywhere you go and spreading it to all of your students. Uh, so again, we appreciate it. Uh, we also want to thank um, all of the supporters that are on, uh, the directors, um, you know, Mr. Pratt, Mr. Pickett, some other music educators, uh, Mr. Young, uh, some other FSU alumni that I see on the call, um, Luther Nick Jurls. Um, if you have any staff, any staff from Luther Nick Jurls that are on, any uh, former Luther Nick Jurls students. Also want to say I went to Luther, Luther Nick Gerald's, but when I went, it was called Edgewood. Oh. <laughs> but but yeah, but any uh, Luther Nick Gerald staff that's on any former students, um, any current students, any any um, that are on as well. Um, also, FSU students, uh, we appreciate uh, your presence as well. Um, again, we're going to continue this, and um, and you've been a great asset to this series um, as we continue on. And um, again, we just want to try to bring the best of the best to our students um, so they can carry on and use the different skills, the different principles, and also the knowledge um, to be successful uh, when they leave Fevel State University. Uh, that's all I have. But thank you, um, everyone, again. I want to pass it back to uh, Dr. Reed. Uh, again, uh, Ms. Waters, appreciate you doing this for us. Um, um, it's, it's a blessing. Um, we are really working and looking forward to, um, you know, doing more with you. Um, you're definitely an asset to the community. Um, as you know, as you know that we have FSU alums that are really technically feeding us here at uh, Fayetteville State. Um, and, I, and, and really your words are really important, um, especially coming from the middle school point of view. Um, to my music educators and to any other music educators out there, there's often this notion of wanting to be at the college level or to do high school. And I would say in the past 25 years, there's been this, this exodus where a lot of directors do not want to do middle school. And that's created uh, some issues with, with music education as a whole. And, you know, to hear Ms. Waters talk about, you know, giving those fundamentals, you know, all 12 scales, you know, you know, getting back to those fundamentals, even in the middle school, that helps, that helps everyone, 
you know, because these middle schools feed these high schools and, you know, further up the chain. And eventually, um, you know, those students, even if they're not music majors, they're gonna become principals and parents that can support uh, band programs. So um, salute on that um, and genuinely appreciate um, all that you do. Um, next week in the uh, series, we have a, a, a unique uh, series where, uh, for lack of better words, we will be uh, political. And uh, we're not, we will not be endorsing any party or any candidate. However, we're gonna express the civic importance um, through the lens of bandsmen, former bandsmen, um, two of which were my former drum majors, um, and two are current uh, attorneys, and they're all musicians, you know, all familiar with band, and, and you know, to help, you know, you all as college students to understand what uh, funding means or what Title III means or how voting works or when you do not vote and you know things don't happen as you would expect them to happen um how um, not voting in midterm elections and how government works uh impacts your funding you know right now we're looking at situations with funding as you know there's no secret that we have no budget uh, and we didn't have one last year before the pandemic because there were shortfalls that was on public record um, due to um, the way things turned out in politics. So they're going to explain these things and how these things impact HBCUs and band programs. So um, continue to do that. And also band uh, on tomorrow. We need everyone right now. I did not hear back from student affairs or athletics. So as of tomorrow, at four o'clock, do not enter the roles unless you're percussion or uh, you are percussion or low brass uh, tubas to get your instruments immediately be outside, keep your distance. If you are playing, it's not gonna be six feet, it's gonna be more than 12 feet apart. Um, and then uh, stay on the band app and on Canvas for notifications. If we get a location, if I get an update, I may get an update this evening if we can go to a certain location on campus so that we can prepare for that um, event that we have coming up. All right, so again, four o'clock, we'll be practicing from four to six, same thing on Monday and Tuesday. And then that performance is on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday afternoon. All right, and thank you again. And we ready for the outro? Prof? Oh, um, no outro today, Doc. Okay. <laughs>